All across America and around the world, this is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. And welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, CW2 helicopter pilot, Vietnam 1969. I want to welcome you to our program today. This is Veterans Week coming up, and Veterans Day is on the 11th, of course. And there's lots of events going on around the country, and so I was kind of thinking like to talk about a couple of those. So I went to this website at the VA and you guys can do this as easily as I can. And it's kind of cool. It's got 500 activities that are going on around the country to uh, acknowledge uh, Veterans Day. And so I, I thought I would pick out a few of them, which I thought were rather interesting. And so the first one was the uh, Veterans Day aboard the battleship Iowa. Uh, battleship Iowa. Wow, I didn't even know where the battleship Iowa was anymore. And it is in Los Angeles. And so you can join uh, this organization. It's on uh, Friday, November 11th from 10 to 2 Pacific time. And it is at the battleship I- Iowa, which is, um, uh, what is it, docked? I'm not in the Navy, so I don't know. <laughs> docked. It's at uh, 250 South Harbor Boulevard in Los Angeles. And it says that they've got a ceremony that's going to be on the fan tail. There's a concert that's going to be brought to you by Rock for the Vets. Uh, food is by Vicky's Doghouse. That sounds interesting. So this is kind of neat. And it's brought to you by the Los Angeles County Veteran Peer Access Network. So that's one, one ship that's going on out there in uh, California. The other one in California, which I thought was really neat, is there's a Fleet Week San Diego Boat Parade Veterans Day celebration, which again is on Friday, November 11th, starting at noon at uh, Shelter Island. And uh, so we, what, what people are doing is that they're decorating their private ships, boats, and, uh, you know, all sorts of patriotic things. And they have a contest for this. And it's, so it says, be part of this event. Salute our veterans and active duty military. If you have a boat and wish to take part in a parade, you can visit their website. That is uh, fleetweeksandiego.org slash veterans dash boat dash parade dash 2022. It says, attention participants, the starting point will be off Shelter Island in the vicinity of buoy number 17. And the pictures are great. So, and this is on that uh, the VA site that I mentioned before uh, of the 500 different locations. Another one, kind of a boat theme going here, is the battleship Missouri in uh, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And they have a Veterans Day sunset ceremony to celebrate the 160th anniversary of the Medal of Honor aboard the Battleship uh, Missouri Memorial with a special tribute to the legacy of Senator Daniel Inouye. Uh, And so those of you that are out in Hawaii, here's a nice activity that you could do on Veterans Day. Uh, Yeah, it says this year marks the 160th anniversary of the Medal of Honor. The United States Armed Forces' highest and most prestigious award for military valor in action from the Civil War to today. Over 3,500 Medal of Honor recipients have been awarded to service members who displayed bravery, courage, sacrifice, and an integrity in the moments that mattered most. And in fact, later in the program, we will have a Medal of Honor little segment that we will play there. Uh, Another boat. Thinking of another boat here, right? Those of you down in Alabama, head on down to Mobile Bay. Because they've got a Veterans Day event and a flag raising ceremony at 7 o'clock uh, Alabama time on the deck of the USS Alabama battleship. And there is going to be not only that, there's going to be a parade with a, a Coast Guard flyover. There's an honor luncheon and there's a parade of flag celebration. And for more information for them, you can go to Veterans www, Veterans Day dash mobile bay. Dot com. So that's just kind of a sample. And as I mentioned, the 500, 500 uh, events going on across the country, that, that's only the ones that the VA has listed on their website, which is uh, news.va.gov uh, slash Veterans Day events. And I think that you'll find that to be really kind of cool. So, you know, what does Veterans Day mean to you? Veterans Day to me means that I, I'm grateful that I was able to serve the country. I'm grateful that obviously that I came home alive. Um, I'm grateful that some many of my comrades are still around, and I think about the ones that didn't make it home. Um, it's not like Memorial Day. It's not quite 
I don't know, I can't say it's not a serious celebration. And it is, it's more of a celebration, let's put it that way. So I think it's kind of an interesting thing to do if you get the opportunity. The other thing I wanted to mention were a couple of local events. You know, we are here in southeast Michigan, and uh, there's two that I can talk about real quickly. Um, One is um, the Stories of Service, and the Stories of Service is coming up on uh, the 9th of November. That's on Wednesday night here in in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it's put on to benefit the Fisher House. And so that's kind of a neat thing. It's... uh, they, they're going to, um, they tell stories. It's going to be at the Michigan theater at seven o'clock. And, uh, one of the storytellers is, is a, uh, a Joe, Joe Schwartz, who is an American physician and who was a politician here in Michigan and was a, uh, representative, as I said, in the Congress, uh, in 2004. And he's a, he's a, he's a good character. He's got some great stories to tell and it's going to be hosted by the, uh, 10 time moth story slam champion, Winner of the 2016 National Storytelling Festival Story Slam, uh, Dr. Ray Christian. And uh, so for more information, you can go to storiesofservice.org uh, and you'll find out more information about that. It's kind of a neat little thing. And at my local employer, the Washtenaw Community College, they also are having a flag raising ceremony. And this is uh, outside of Ann Arbor. 715 in front of the student center. They're going to be uh, having a flag raising. And then they have a breakfast at the uh, restaurant inside the student center. And this is for all veterans. A Veterans Day ceremony is going to be held outside of the student veterans center. And I think it's a great opportunity. And all around the, the southeast Michigan, I know that there are many, many parades. Check out your local community to see what's going on. I think you know, it's, it's a great time, a great opportunity. Some of us are trying to fit into our uniforms. It's, it's you know, we get to see other veterans and uh, it's just, um, it makes us really appreciate what we did. Cause you know, so, so many times when so, some people came home, let's put it that way, we weren't welcomed at the, uh, the top of the list was not uh, to welcome their veterans home. But you know, we'll get over that. We have to do that eventually. You know, the other thing that's going on today on our program is that we have the opportunity to interview a World War II veteran, and his name is Art Fishman, and Art Fishman is the uh, Michigan Veteran of the Year. He's 95 years old, and he's still, still helping veterans. So stick around, because that interview is going to be coming up in just a moment. And we did that uh, interview with uh, Kate Melcher from Fisher House, and I interviewed him last week. So I'm pretty excited about that. Before we get to that interview, though, I need to make sure that we thank our sponsors because without their help, we can't do this program at all. Uh, Number one is going to be the uh, Legal Help for Veterans. Uh, Legal Help for Veterans specializes in veterans' disability claims. Give them a call at Legal Help for Veterans at 800-693-4800. The National Veterans Development, uh, excuse me, the National Veterans Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, is the nation's leading third-party authority for certification of veteran-owned businesses. If you want to do business with the federal government and you are a veteran-owned business, you need to be certified. So for more information, you can go to their website, that's nvbdc.org, or give them a call at 888-237-8433. Uh, the Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we want to thank them for their continuing support. For more information, you can go to va.gov slash Ann Arbor Healthcare. We just happen to be a little prejudiced. We like to think that our VA center happens to be one of the best in the country. Uh, we also want to make sure that we thank our, uh, the Irwin Prescott and American Legion Post 46 and the Charles S. Kettles Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 310. All of Both of these are in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, you can learn more about these organizations and their services as well as how you can become a supporter of Veterans Radio by going to our website at veteransradio.net. And click on our sponsors or click on the donate button because Veterans Radio is a production of Veterans Radio America. And Veterans Radio America is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and your donation should be tax deductible. You may need to talk to your financial advisor regarding that. So that's, you know, what's going on around the country. 
coming up to Veterans Day. But today we're going to be talking to one of our favorite local veterans, and that is Art Fishman. And as I mentioned, we talked with him and Kate Melcher um, last week. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be show, um, putting that interview up for you to listen to. You're listening to Veterans Radio. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Lieutenant J.G. William Hall pressed the attack, although seriously wounded during the Battle of the Coral Sea. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. Hall was the pilot of a scouting plane in action against enemy Japanese forces in the Coral Sea. In a determined attack on 7th of May, 1942, Hall dove his plane at an enemy Japanese aircraft carrier, contributing materially to the destruction of that vessel. On the 8th of May, facing heavy and fierce fighter opposition, He again displayed extraordinary skill as an airman and the aggressive spirit of a fighter in repeated and effective counterattacks against the superior number of enemy planes in which three enemy aircraft were destroyed. Though seriously wounded in this engagement, Hall succeeded in landing his plane safe. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative... Maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. We can all help someone going through a difficult time. Learn how you can be there for veterans. Visit VeteransCrisisLine.net. VeteransCrisisLine.net. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. All right. Hey, we're back here on Veterans Radio, and I'm really excited to have you meet our our latest Veterans Radio friend. His name is Art Fishman, and Art is a World War II veteran, and he has recently been named the Michigan Veteran of the Year. So uh, joining me also on the line is uh, Kate Melcher, who happens to be on our board of directors of Veterans Radio America. And as everybody in Southeast Michigan knows all about, she's the executive director of Fisher House, Michigan. And so... This is the connection that we've got going here on Veterans Radio. So, Art, I want to welcome you to the program. I thank you for bringing me into the program, okay? <laughs> I'm honored that you'd want to hear whatever I've got to say <laughs> and what a few experiences I've had to let you know about, all right? Well, that's, it's, it's our privilege to talk to you because a lot of your work not only was in the service, but since you've been out of the service, you've been doing everything it sounds like possible to help your fellow veterans. Well, that's been my feeling that I owe because I'm here. Now you say, what, are they, what kind of a statement is that? I was, I went from one end of the Pacific all the way through to China. Okay. I know a lot of battles where there were so many lost. I had a friend that I lost in Okinawa. And when I was coming from, we were, we were going from, uh, 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 let's see, from Iwo Jima to Okinawa, I could see this big mountain in the middle of it, and I could never understand why. What did they need that for? There's nothing there until you come to the other side and you see all these uh, B-24 bombers there, okay, that flew from there to Japan and wherever they had to go. It made sense before. It didn't. It doesn't make sense unless you know the whole story of why. That's, okay? that's, that's very uh, true. It, it goes back to the beginning. You asked me what about the Air Corps? Yeah, I was in the Air Corps. Well, how'd you get in the Air Corps? And how old were you? I was going to Cass Tech High, and they started, a, no, I was going to Central High, I'm sorry. And I heard that Cass Tech the following year was going to start a program for fellows who want to get in the Air Corps. It was a, a, a program that they were going to try out to see if they could learn in high school enough to get them in the Air Corps. Okay, we went 12 fellows in this first program. We went to city airport in Detroit, okay, one day a week. The rest of our instruction came from school at Gas Tech, 
Okay. And that one day we were there, we spent one hour, listen to this, one hour uh, in the air. Okay. That was all the training we got. We could not take off or land. We were drove, we were on Texan, Texas AT6 training planes. Three wheels are kind of, they're up in the air and you got to twist around to see where you're going. Okay. Uh, we did, uh, let's see, seven weeks. Okay. And on the seventh week, they were going to make a decision. When we got there uh, to our class, we went up, we had our training. We thought we would get to take off and land on that seventh session. They did not give it to us at that time. When we landed, we, we, met a Navy ensign or a captain. I'm not sure because I didn't know much about the ranks at that time. And he said, you guys did well on your program. Okay. And I hate to tell you this, but we don't need single engine pilots anymore. The whole war has changed to four engine pilots. Okay. You guys are not smart enough. You didn't learn enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> that comes back to the story. Just telling you when I got to, uh, uh, Okinawa, I saw all the four-inch bombers, and then it made sense to me. He was right. They need those four-inch bombers, not single-engine pilots. And so when when was it cadet school? When, what, how old that were you? That was in 1944. I was 17 okay. years old at that time. Okay. All right. Okay. So the all war right. would do And I received an honorary discharge from service. I was through. I didn't have to do anything. I was done for the war, believe it or not. They said, you're through. <laughs> Okay, you got enough points to keep you out. Okay, they will not go ahead and you don't have to register for anything else. Well, I went down the next day to see if I get the Naval Air Corps. Okay, and they had me come back a couple of days later, talk to, to their recruiters there. And they said, well, what experience have you had? I told them what I went through. He said, well, it'd be hard for me to say no to you, but I don't think you're smart enough. Okay. And he would say, no, wait a minute. These guys were recruiters. They know what they wanted. Okay. Mm -hmm. They looked at your education. They looked at your marks. Okay. I was a, a, a C plus, a B minus student. I was not a B or an A student. That's what they were looking for. Okay. And I was aware that's when I learned my first lesson, what they wanted. Okay. So I said, well, if, I really would like to. He said, well, come in tomorrow in the afternoon, about one o'clock. I've got a test coming up. Okay. I come there one o'clock. They give me a yellow pad and a number two pencil with a point on. And he says, okay, at two o'clock, we'll start the class. About three, three or four o'clock, he come in there, look at my paper. He said, give me that for a minute. He takes it over to somebody else. He comes back. He looks at me. He says, Fishman, you're in the Navy. <laughs> We're taking you to the Air Corps. You did all right on that test. Cool. Now, I must say honestly, I did not do all right on that test. <laughs> I, I knew I didn't know that much about the math that they were using at that time. Mm -hmm. I could not do it. I can think in my head now without a pad of paper and know what my answers are going to be. I couldn't then. Okay. <laughs> and I felt that, hey, they wanted one more guy to go in. That was it. I think that's a, that's a that's a great story because because I can kind of relate to that. Both Kate and I are helicopter pilots. If yeah. you didn't know that, and I was, I I joined the Army Air Corps at, in uh, in the nineteen sixty seven because I didn't want to be in the infantry. Mm -hmm. And so when I took my aptitude test, they told me that I don't know if you're going to be able to make it through flight school or not. This is a little bit shaky here, but we're going uh -huh. to give you the chance anyhow. And yeah. I, I have a, you know, obviously I, I survived somehow. Um, and lucky you, <laughs> <laughs> lucky me, right? Yes, you know, and then, you know, 30, almost 40 years later, um, Kate goes in as a, um, she actually volunteers for this whole thing, I think, but she went into the service first, not as a pilot, did you? I enlisted first and then got picked up for OCS and flight school. Um, but interestingly, when I did become an aviation branch officer, uh, the Army Air Corps was no more because in 1983, the Army Air Corps became the aviation branch within the United States Army. Oh. So, you know, when I when I meet Vietnam era aviators and older, you know, if if they're wearing some of their 
um, insignia, you know, there'll be infantry officers, but they also have wings. You know, it's really interesting to see how they how they came through the pipeline. But Art, I, I love that story of you being a you know a teenager at Cast Tech and seven hours of flight training, and you didn't need to go back, but you decided to raise your right hand again. Yeah. And that sounds like a you know foreshadowing for what the rest of your life has been. You're you're sort of a volunteer extraordinaire. Well, let me go. Can I go a little farther? That Kate, my mother died when I was five or six years old. Okay, I was raised up in a different way with my grandmother, with other parents. Okay, I didn't have the same training so many kids had at home. Okay, and the believe it or not, the service rescued me. It made my life different. You know why? Because I learned much from other people that had things I didn't have, let's say physically or mentally. Okay. And I always felt I had to do something else to keep myself in line with everybody else. Okay. And it's hard. it may be hard for some people to understand. Some people will understand immediately what I'm saying. Okay. I've been involved with people as far back as I can remember. Okay. Why? Because I wanted to be involved with people, okay? I was that way in school. I was that way in service, okay? And when I got out of service, I went to uh, Wayne State and registered there. I said, I'm going to go to law school. And I put my name on the list. And they said, oh, let me see your other marks <laughs> from high school. They looked at it, fine. Uh, yeah, we'll accept you because you were in service. You are number 174 of 36 seats we have available. Oh, my. Okay. One, that's all I had after the war. Think about that. They didn't have the schools you could go to, okay? My my son was a 31 to Cooley. Man, if I'd had that opportunity, you may be talking to an attorney now, right now <laughs> okay? <laughs> Instead of me. All right? But that that's what life is all about. So you accept it, you go on, all right? And uh, uh, based on that, I, I just... Went from one thing to another, okay? I accidentally got into the real estate business, okay, with a couple other guys, and we bought some houses, and I learned that from buying houses how to process a mortgage, because I had to sit on a house till they get around to get them approved and everything, and then I... Uh, Went to FHA and I talked to one of the instructors there. I says, I don't understand because I had a, a loan turned out. Why you rejected this loan? He says, because you're not that smart. He, tells me, he, says, to me, he says, you come Monday morning. No, that's the truth. Downtown FHA. You come to my class Monday morning. Okay. And uh, we'll teach you what it is. And I spent a week there. Okay. The following week. Uh, I went out and I took the loans that I had, revised them. It got three loans approved in one day. Man, this guy's a hero. Look at what he got here. I was dealing with other investors and bought real estate, but I wouldn't tell him my answer, my secret. Okay. And uh, we have a guy right now from uh, uh, Rock Financial. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did business with his mother. His mother at that time was the one that started Rock Financial, not him. But he was a smart kid, and him and his brother knew what they were doing. They say, you go back with all these guys, why did you wind up not the mortgage company? I did. I had a company called Republic Mortgage with two other partners. Why? Because I did not have $150,000 that you needed to go into the mortgage business at that time. Okay, they did. They put up the money for the raw and the association worked out well until we made money. And once we made so much money, these fellows were depression area guys. They look at all the money we got. Let's sell our mortgage company and go. I didn't have a choice. Okay. It's not. It sounds like you fooled an awful lot of people along the way who told you you weren't yeah, that smart. Well, no, I, I think I'm a good studier. I think you are. I, I think you are. It is. And, and I went for that and, and building and then uh, I got married. I had three kids and uh, my wife got in the antique business. Okay. And I had a house full of junk okay, <laughs> because that's all she did. It was buy junk and in the meantime, I was buying and selling houses. Well, let's, 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 let's kind of 
circle back our wagons a little bit here. We're talking with uh, Art Fishman here. He's a World War II veteran and Michigan uh, Veteran of the Year for 2022. And uh, when you got out of their service, you know, we know that you eventually ended up in real estate and doing mortgages and so forth. But you also got very involved in the veteran community. Can no. can you tell me about you got heavily no, involved in the Jewish War Veterans uh, Organization? What happened? My associates I were with were both in service also. And they said, we, there's a new group called the Jewish War Veterans of Michigan. We're going to go join it. This was in 1967. That's when I joined this group. Okay. That was for, made up of so many veterans that were, uh, that had left service. They, it was a social group at that time. Not a military, a social group where guys sat around. They talked, they visited, they they played cards, they did one thing or another. Together, uh, after so many years, they bought a house. Or one of the builders that was a veteran gave a house on 12 Marwood in, in Southfield. And that was a headquarters there. Okay. I became part of that group. I had an assignment. I washed the dirty dishes. That was nice. No, that's the truth. <laughs> I was low on the totem pole, okay? And, and uh, uh, I was involved with that on and off. And I, my wife's family uh, had property in Florida. I kept going back and forth. I got involved with some other people buying real estate down there. Okay, and at one time I got involved with a builder that just started to build uh, condos down there in a place called Surfside. Remember where those buildings fell down? Mm. Well, I know more. I know why they fell, and I can tell the whole story, but this program ain't long enough. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, uh, I, I was going trapped between Florida to here, and uh, uh, my wife got sick at that time, and I had to give up everything for about six years. Because I couldn't, I couldn't hospitalize her. She wouldn't stay in the hospital. She's a terrible patient, and uh, and then in between that, I would be doing other things. And that's how I got involved with other guys because I had I'd make time to be involved in different groups that mm -hmm. that I had time for. Well, did you find that when the your organization got started, the uh, Jewish War Veterans, did, was it as you said, it was a social group, and I think probably like so many of the other veterans groups that are out there it was just a camaraderie of you know kind of a shared experience and right. you could sit there and play cards and if you felt like talking about your experiences during the, you know the world war ii in your case you could talk about it because that's an audience that was you know friendly to you a lot of yeah, people don't necessarily have been through the same thing that you had right okay because many many of them were b-14 pilots we are not. Many of them, or most of them, were officers that have been involved. In they got back in the commercial building, they get commercial real estate. I mean, they were guys that over a period of time uh, uh, became wealthy from the war, that their family got wealthy through the war, and they extended on. That's all. But it's mean, a, that's, that's, it, that's what I, in my observation, noticed that. Okay. You know, Art, um, you've spent a lot of your life volunteering with our veteran brothers and sisters. And because you're still so involved, I wonder what you have to say to the veterans that are younger than you, the Vietnam era and the Iraq and Afghanistan era veterans. Well, you know, I'm involved with them, Kate. I'm of course. I'm involved in the Detroit parade. I'm with these guys. Well, I've been, I've been with them for nine or 10 years. Okay, what do I say to them? I talk to them. Uh, about what I can do that they would understand that I'm doing. Okay, I can I don't like to talk to somebody about something that they don't understand. So when I talk to you, I know what you and I are going to discuss. Okay, if I talk to you, you know about the aircraft, you know about this or that. Or if I talk about fishing, about fishing boats, you would know about fishing boats. Okay. I'm going to take a subject away from our conversation. So I try to keep any conversation I have something that pertains to you and I and Dale. Why? What's the purpose of us being together if we're not going to have something in common to talk about? Okay. And I find the same thing when I'm talking with guys that are in Vietnam and that were in Korea. What do we talk about? what we're going to be doing. 
what program we got. We're doing Detroit Parade. We're doing this. We've got a program for veterans to help them. We've got a money program to help people that need it. We've got a food program. We all have something in common then. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how anything else is not important. What are we doing today that we all have together, Kate? And that's why I'm with you. You're going to say to me tomorrow, hey, Art, I need you to talk about something. He called me two days. I said, sure, okay, tell me what you want. I'll be there. Why? Because I know it's important to you. I know it's important to show people here. We are still all together. Let's do it all together. Let's make this country a better country if we can. I, I, I couldn't agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. We have uh, one of the founders of Veterans Radio. His name was Gary Lilly. He, his motto was every day he would say, what have I done to help a veteran today? Yeah. And that's what we do. You know, yeah. there's so many veterans out there from all these different eras that are trying to figure out how they can help their fellow veteran. Now, I know you've done a lot of you've been involved in so many different activities. In fact, just earlier you were talking that you're ordering flags for for the uh, tombstones for Veterans Day, probably. Yes. That's very important to me. And I'll tell you why it is. I was fortunate when I was in service. OK. I was overseas. I was in action. I know what we were. I was below deck all the time. I have no idea which guns were firing, which were not, what what was going on in there until I was told the next day. All right. So you say, now, this is what I can do in return. Okay. I took over as commander of our honor guard. Okay. We formed an honor guard to do one thing, to see that all Jewish veterans had proper burial, proper service, make sure that they go through their proper service with a rabbi, okay, and that we play taps at the end, okay? That has been my main goal for the past, I would say, 10 years, okay? Very active at it. During the time that we, 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 that one year that things were bad, I did every service myself. Why? Because first of all, they didn't want people there. The families didn't want people. Around. They're all afraid of what they would get. Okay. The rabbis didn't want anybody around there. But I felt here, if I do it myself, I okay, can covered. I will do it without being near or touching anybody except the coffin. Okay. I saw that I did the service. I saw that I had a flag in every service. I made sure that the family received this flag at the end of the service. And I made sure the taps was played at the end. Why I play taps? No, I can't play it. But I have an automatic trumpet that does. <laughs> okay, so at the end of the service, I always thought I've done the complete service. Okay, it's done. I, 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 and, I, I, and you say, that that's my payback for the time I was in service. Okay, that I came back unarmed. I came back mentally more stable than when I left. I came back more educated than when I left. Okay, and and, and you learn, you learn. I'm going to learn every day. I'm going to learn something from you today. I know I am. Why we're all here? We're talking a subject we all understand. Okay, and and that's what's going to happen. Okay, if you sit with people and have the same goal, you learn from each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are talking with Art Fishman here, as I mentioned before, Michigan Veteran of the Year for 2022. And um, you mentioned that when you were in the Navy, you were below deck. So were you like a boiler down in the I boiler rooms? An engineer. Oh, I I'm from, sorry. The official engineer. Yes. Well, no, let me explain to you what the difference is. I started as, a, as an able-bodied seaman. I would be on duty a minimum of four hours. OK, they brought me there because they were short uh, of engineers that understand what each gauge was. Now, why was I so smart? When I was in the Air Corps, I knew what each gauge was. You had to know them. <laughs> right. Okay? They had only six or seven gauges. OK, not like he's hey, got 40 gauges. Can't it look at a cape while she's flying? You know, we had four or five gauges. We had to know air speed. We had to know where how the water was, where the oil was, where the gas. And there, that and I learned that when I was in the six or seven weeks. Okay, so that when they put me, they brought me there. They put me below deck. Okay, and I would sit there for a minimum of four hours. Then we lost another man, and I would go work five hours, and before long I'd be working a six-hour shift. 
Why? I didn't care because my the, the, our chief would allow me to study while I was working. So I had my manager say I would study, and every 15 minutes, 18 minutes, i make my rounds to check both boilers and make sure there's nothing red. If it's red, I'm in trouble. Okay. <laughs> now, red is, red is never good. <laughs> I went from a seaman, fire first class, second, third class, second class, first class, and all the time I was there. Because I get done, they'd give me the test. I would, I had no trouble passing the test there, and I, and I knew I passed them. Okay, I was eligible for officer training in the Navy when I got discharged. Okay, I, I didn't want to. Okay, I didn't feel I want to spend the next four years in the Navy because that's what it would have taken at that time a four year enrollment to go through the classes and everything they expected at that time. Why the war was over if you stayed in, you got the yeah, I tried to clear my language. <laughs> the worst job there was. Okay. Right, right. Why? Because yeah, you know, they only got so many, and they're going to beat up on you. Okay, and I said, no, the smartest thing for me to do is to leave. Okay. So, Art, where were you when you learned the news that the war was over? Oh, that's a, it's a story, too. We were in, uh, we left uh, uh, Iwo Jima. Okay, we were there. Uh, we stopped in the harbor to see the flag. We could see the flag from our ship, okay? And after that, we went on, and in the middle of the night, uh, we were going from there to Okinawa, okay? The captain stopped the ship. I think I've got the date here somewhere. I know I did. Uh, and he said, gentlemen, the war just ended. He said, you fellas are, are fortunate. You've lived through all of this. You're all going home. He says, that was it. He says, now we're going, we're, we're, our destination is Shanghai, China. That was the first time I knew I was going to China when he announced it that night. From there, I told you we went to uh, Okinawa the next day, and I learned my lesson about the four engine bombers, what they were for and what they did. And then from there, we went to, to Shanghai by way of a place called the Wangpu River, which is the entrance to the streets that go from Shanghai to Hong Kong, okay, and it goes around that circle in there that brings you in the, you're, you're, you're so far from Korea, you can touch it, okay, and people have to look at the map to understand what went on there. Now, when we were in, in, uh, in Shanghai, we get an order in the morning, four destroyers are going to Korea. Now, this is 1946. Nobody even heard or knew what Korea was. MacArthur said, decided that we're going to go to Korea, but we're going to come in the backside of Korea. We did four destroyers. We come in, and when we come in the backside towards a city called Sing Tao. Now, I remember those names real well because they were an important part of what I was doing at that time. Okay, and I had to write these names down because they were different. That's how I learned to write it down 10 times. I would. And we came, we were coming to Sinta, Korea, and we were about 12 miles out. Okay, and we could see the, the, the holes there. They were all the same. They all had green shed roofs up there. It must have been from the trees in there and, and everything else. And you could see a, a whole village there. And we got about 12 miles out there. And all of a sudden, we got dead stop. We got from the bridge. Dead stop. Everything stopped. They said, the water is so shallow there, we're going to scrape our bottom. Backed out. They sent a message back to uh, His Highness Eisenhower. I mean, uh, 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 MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur, who was in charge at that time. They called him His Highness for some reason. <laughs> okay. And he said, then go back to Shanghai. Okay. But he knew at that time there would be trouble in Korea. And he anticipated it and figured that the U.S., if they get involved, they could come in the back way. You go from there, from uh, Korea to all the way down to all the small little cities in there that are, that are 10 blocks long. And it's a whole country by themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you learn from that. And I say, yeah, what was, what was this for? I don't know. 
I don't know. But I know that was the one time I was on deck to see, okay, because I was in between shifts. When I just went up on deck, I was up a couple of times on deck in the middle of the night because I needed night training. So what they would do, they put dark glasses on me for about an hour, two hours, okay, and then send us up uh, into the crow's nest, okay. Once you get up there, we take the glasses off, and you look as like daylight. And the reason for that is they can say, if there's anything out in the water, you can see it from where you're at. You're 12, 14 miles out, 20 miles out, and you could see that far at, in the middle of the night. That's another <laughs> lesson I learned. Never Early even, night oh, vision oh. before all the technology to assist. Yeah, well, I think that uh, that that was something that they knew that they did, you know. And and, and the, the thinking was there, if your eyes could see and vision all this at night, they had to get them ready for it, and they got them ready for it by doing that. It was quite an experience to, to be up there by yourself looking around, okay? <laughs> I think that, that that's. I mean, I found that being in service was interesting. So I didn't want to spend my life there. Now, some guys did. They enjoyed it. They felt it was important. Uh, I wanted to have a family because I was something I was missing. Okay, and that's how I did it. I think that that's that's amazing. When we when you were talking about Kate mentioned the night goggles and stuff, and we didn't have night goggles. We all of our instruments inside of our helicopters at night were all red. And, uh-huh. and that was to, to prevent us from losing our night vision because, uh-huh. you know, when we would, we would make our landings to the ground, you wanted to be able to see the ground. Sure. And, and when we lost our night vision, we, we would lose our sense of percept or depth perception. And so everything was always red. And even the flashlights had a little red lens on it and so forth. And nobody, you couldn't light up a cigarette in the in the cockpit at night and so on and so forth. It was kind of kind of interesting. I mean, all of the all of the interesting things that you learn while you're in the service, you know, that you do, you end up using them later on only because they're experiences of working with so many different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. And you know, you mentioned the uh, starting of the the Jewish War Veterans Organization, and that so many of the activities that you do are just to help other veterans. Yeah. So what would you mention that you're doing? You know, you did the flags and you d- you did all the honor guard thing all the way through COVID. It sounds like I did it and, for a year. That's, and that, I had nothing happening. God bless us. Somebody took care of me to make sure I didn't get it. Okay? I guess so. Because yeah. he knew what I was doing. Okay. You, you were busy. <laughs> you were busy. I think that's 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 very that's so admirable that that you were able to do that. I know that there are organizations all over the country. And so I bring this up that are trying to uh, rebuild their honor guards uh, yeah. so that they make sure that, that every veteran, when they pass away, that there is somebody there yes. to give them the flag, to play taps, even if it's on a <laughs> programmed trumpet. Well, but it, that, that's important. To make people understand there are two ways of doing something. Now, I'm involved with uh, American Legion in Berkeley. Why? Because a lot of these guys are involved with me in downtown and what we do, and, and they are close to me. And uh, I felt if I'm going to be part of American Legion, I want to be part of a group that's near me, so mm-hmm. I don't have too far to go. And the same with American uh, uh, VFW, Veterans of World War, about, uh, a group that's near me. Why? Because I felt it's important that I do belong, because I was part of that. Okay, and and uh, all it involves are just paying your dues <laughs> because my social activities are more with the Vietnam vets and with the people I'm dealing with that are active. Now, why? Mm-hmm. Because you can be in a big group of a hundred guys, you know, two or three or four or five are the active guys. The rest of the guys just they come along because you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I find that you get any group you get, unless you got somebody that's going to lead, then nobody follows. Right. Well, there always has to be a leader because there's always people yeah. that will and follow. You got to say that's right. Okay, mm-hmm. we had in our group uh, six different guys trying to put a, together a Hanukkah for our party for our Hanukkah, which is like Christmas to you. Okay, mm-hmm. it's a it's a social activity here. So I listened to him go out for three weeks. 
Okay, two days ago, I got all my commanders. You guys, okay, are you guys done playing? I'll put it together. I did it one day. Why? Because I knew who could do it. I knew I could get a cater. I knew what temple I could go to. I knew what rabbi I could go to. Why? I prepared them ahead of time for what I was going to do. I got an okay before I did it. Why? I don't want to start something that didn't fall on my face. Right, yeah. You don't want to do things halfway. Yeah. So now we're going to have an affair on the 18th of December at my temple, Shir Shalom, which I've been there. I'm a founding member of that temple. Since before they built it, I've been involved there uh, with our brotherhood for, I don't know, 20 years on their board. I've been their head usher for all the holidays we have there to make sure people got their seats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't know what, the frustra- what frustration that is. I can't make you understand <laughs> For people who have paid and their donation we started, they bought a seat for a thousand dollars. Well, they're gonna come in five years from now and say, Who's sitting in my seat? But it's not their seat anymore. You know. So you gotta move people. You gotta appease everybody you can. Do the best you can. You know, Art, I understand you were talking about, you know, all of the, the holidays at Temple Shear Shalom, and that's in West Bloomfield, correct? Yeah. Um I understand that you do a special Shabbat service for Veterans Day. Do I have that right? Yes, but not this year. Why? Mm-hmm. We, we're in the process of enlarging our place. Okay. Sherrod Zedek is going to do it. Uh, and and uh, two of them. Uh, and also uh, the Holocaust Center. The, they're going to be doing some sort of a, yes, I have done it every year except this year for the past five years. I was the first one that started that. Okay. Why? Because I had uh, two rabbis that felt that it was nice that we are involved and they gave me a lot of leeway to do it. Could you tell us a little bit more about it for folks that aren't of the Jewish faith? What, okay. what, what our, our service it's very simple when we did the service uh, for the Jewish war vets. I would get all my vets and line them up, okay, outside of the lobby, okay. Uh, once we got ready to go in, okay, uh, our cantor uh, would, be, would be singing uh, one military song after another as we marched in. We would be seated in a separate area there, okay, one or two of us would be involved in the service, okay, to say the prayers or the entrance to the prayers. Those are the first prayers that we say, okay. Uh, I tried to pass it around so that we had different guys. Then at after the first part was done, we would do the last part of the service. I would assign a part to every veteran that I could that could speak the part. Okay, that's how we got involved. And then it would end that way with a uh, a no dig or a party that we called it, a get together. And that's what it started. But all the temples uh, are doing it now. And I think it's wonderful that they do. Okay. Uh, and, and and the reason for that is brotherhood coming together again. Mm-hmm. That's a simple one. I'm glad you brought it up, Kate. Okay, because I think you know something about it. All right. <laughs> I think it is beautiful and such a wonderful way to honor veterans within your community. Yes. Uh, I, I realized recently we uh, we had Captain Tom Stemke on our program not too long ago, and I had grown up with the Stemke family going to the same church, and I never knew he was a veteran until I was an adult and came back to Michigan and met him at a Memorial Day parade. Oh, my. I had no idea that he was a Vietnam veteran, a helicopter pilot, a Silver Star recipient, and I'd grown up knowing him as Mr. Stemke and sitting next to him in the church pew. So the fact that you're bringing uh, the veterans out into the open uh, in a special Shabbat service, I think that's very special. Yeah, I bring them all out. And if I have to, I bring them in a wheelchair. Whatever it takes, I bring them out. Okay, because I think it's important that anybody that wants to be involved is involved. And we don't discriminate because you can't walk or you have a problem. We'll bring you there. I think that's so so special. It's 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 that's a wonderful thing that you do, and I think that there are so many of these veterans. I was, um, your age and younger. Uh, I was when I was at the VA hospital yesterday. I was just kind of sitting there for a long time, it seemed, and I'm watching the patients so come. Which hospital were you at? Uh, Ann Arbor. Okay. And I'm watching the you know just this parade of of veterans, male, female, young, old, and everything, and they're just going. 
we just need to keep recognizing these people, just letting them know, because they did do something special. They did something. They volunteered. They didn't know what they were getting into, as you just you mentioned earlier on. But, they, you know, some of them learned the life skills. Some of them learned how to live their lives finally. And they, they developed this community of, of former, you know, of other veterans. And we decided that we were all just going to help each other. Because while we're in the service, we take care of each other. And some of them need care now. And it's up to people like you and Kate and so many of the other people that are out there to continue taking care of our veteran community. And remembering them. Now, I know if you're aware of what's going on in Woodward in 13, the World War II uh, Memorial, Legacy Memorial, that they we're building there. Well, we funded it already. We did a preliminary groundbreaking ceremony. And I hope that this week the electric will go in so we can start digging and building. Okay. It is a memorial with different scenes of who was in the service at that time. Army, Navy, uh, Rosies, Air Corps, et cetera. There's six different scenes. They're done in brass. Okay, they will be the display. There's a wall there in back there, similar to the one in Washington. You know, Washington has this. Well, this will be the same way. Okay, uh, the entrance to that is with bricks that people have purchased already. That we that will be the walk. They're bricks that tell people's name, what they've done, what they've been in service, who their memory of, etc. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that will be the entrance to this. Okay, we will have six flags up there for the different branches of service. Okay, uh, which is uh, uh, mortgage cover. All of a sudden, I can't think of his name. Uh, is that mortgage cover? Dan Gilbert and Quick Dan Gilbert. Gilbert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So Dan Gilbert has come up with the money to pay for six flags for us. And we've got to put him in some big pole on. It was a, so nice of him to do. Okay. And they will be, within a year, we think we'll have it all laid out. Within two years, it'll be completed. And the reason I got involved, simple. I never thought they would do it. I never thought I would live to see it. Now you say, well, those are powerful words. Yes, they are. I got involved with Debbie Hollis and, and, and the other group there. And I said, you know, I'm going to be here. I don't know if I can help you or not, because I won't live long enough to see this. Okay. I was with Rich Luderman. You know, Rich Luderman, he's a weatherman for Channel 2. Oh, Rich is part of our group also. And Rich was walking with me. He says, Fish, we'll be here, you and I. <laughs> and we did a video that was on, uh, on the news a couple of times. And the end of the video is me saluting the American flag which I always do at the end of my service. So well, you understand a great point. You know that? Well, Art Fishman, World War II veteran, he was just talking to us about the Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial. And if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to michiganww2memorial.org. They've got a bunch of photographs. There's nice video clips. And um, Art, I'm glad you've got Rich Luderman um, helping make news stories for you. Um, yeah. The biggest news lately related to Art Fishman is that you were recently named the Michigan Veteran of the Year. Would you tell us a bit about that, how that came to be? You know, I want to tell you the truth. I didn't know until they told me I was elected. I said, for what? I said, is this a different job? Did you try to drop something? Said, no. And I looked there to see every veteran organization was there. Okay. Each veteran organization had a vote. Okay, they had two votes from all of them. I received 99% of the votes. The only one who didn't vote for me was me. (laughs) No, no, I didn't know what it was until they told me. All right. I found that it was quite an honor for them to do it. Okay. Uh, Phil Smith, who was uh, the commander of this group, uh, made the award to me. They did a plaque, which is fine. Uh, the idea was that I didn't know what it was or expect it, 
because they said, hey, we know nobody has done more work for all our organizations than you have. I, one of our two commanders or one of the American Legion groups says, you've never said no, you couldn't help us or know that you wouldn't do it. Okay. And when it came out, your name came up for a vote. There was nobody here that could say no again either. And thank you for bringing it up, Katie. Okay. Well, it's that, that certainly is an honor for a lifetime of work for veterans that, that you have done, Art. And uh, we're so very proud and pleased to be able to talk with you today here on Veterans Radio. And um, I guess I could say, you know, is there, are there any parting shots that you'd like to give to our audience as what they can yes, do to help out is. America's veterans? I, first of all, I'm honored to be here to represent World War II veterans. I have to say to myself, I recognize them. I honor them. I honor the guys that are that are still in service that haven't come out yet. I honor the guys that are not coming back. Bless them all. It's an emotional thing for me when I go to that because I think about what our service has been and how fortunate I am that I'm back, that I've been through all this. Okay? And based on that, I say thank you for giving me an opportunity to say something to people that I hope you all understand. Okay? I was honored to be in service. I was honored to be part of everything everybody else is. And I hope I've done my part as well as I could. More than anybody that I know. More than anybody that I know. And Art Fisher, we want to thank you for being on our program. And uh, since you salute everybody when you're done, I salute you, sir. And I salute you in return, sir. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Art. He's a a character, that's for sure. 95 years old, Michigan's Veteran of the Year. Still very, very active in what is going on in the veteran community up where he lives. And there's sure there are many more like him that are out there. And if you have somebody that you would like to have us interview on Veterans Radio, please send me an, uh, an email. That's dale at veteransradio.net. And we'll contact them and get them on the program. So again, if you have any stories that you think we should cover here on Veterans Radio, let us know. We're happy that you uh, listened in today. We hope that you have a just a wonderful Veterans Day and that you'll come back next week and uh, we're going to have a little anniversary program for you, 19 years on the radio here at Veterans Radio. So until then, this is Dale Thromberry for all of us here at Veterans Radio. You are dismissed. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.